Vibhavari Shesha Aloka Pravesha Nidratari Yoto Jiva Vibhavari Shesha Aloka Pravesha Nidra Tadi Yota Jiva Bolo Hari Hari Mokunda Morari Rama Krishna Haya Kriva Bolo Hari Hari Mokunda Morari Rama Krishna Haya Kriva Nashim Mahavamana Shri Madhutu Dhanna Rajendra Nanda Nashama Narsim Mahavamana Shri Madhusudhana Prajandra Nandana Shama Putana Gatana Kaitabhadasana Jaya Dasarati Rama Bhutana Gatana Kaitabhashatana Jaya Dasarati Rama Yashoda Dula Lau Govinda Gopala Vrindavana Puranda Yashoda Dula Lau Govinda Gopala Vrindavana Purandara Gopi Priya Janna Radhika Ramana Bhavana Sundara Bhara Gopi Priya Janna Radhika Ramana Bhavana Sundara Bhara Gopi 
Ravanata Kora Makanataskara Gopi Jana Vastra Hari Ravana Thakura Makana Thaskara Gopi Jana Vastra Hare Rajerara Kala Gopa Brinda Pala Chitta Hare Vamsita Hare Rajerara Kala Gopa Vrinda Pala Chitta Hare Vamsita Hare Yogindra Bandana Shri Nanda Nandana Prajajana Bhaya Hare Yogendra Bandhana Shri Nanda Nandhana Prajajana Bhaya Hare Nabi Nanirada Rupa Manohara Mohana Bamsi Bihari Nabi Nanirada Rupa Manohara Mohana Bamsi Bihari Yashoda Nandana Kamsa Nishudana Nikunja Rasa Vilase Yashoda Nandana Kamsa Nishudana Nikunja Rasa Vilase Kadamba Kanana Rasa Parayana Brinda Vipina Nibhase Kadamba Kanana Rasa Parayana Brinda Vipina Nibhase Kadamba 
Ananda Vardana Primani Ketana Pleasure Yojakakana Ananda Vardana Premani Ketana Plashara Yoja Kakana Gopanga Nagana Chitta Vinodana Samasta Guna Gana Dhamma Gopanga Nagana Chitta Vinodana Samasta Guna Gana Dhamma Yamuna Jeevana Kili Parayana Manasa Chandra Chakora Yamuna Jeevana Kili Parayana Manasa Chandra Chakora Namashura Ras, Go Krishna Yas, Rako Vachana Mana Mora. Namashura Ras, Go Krishna Yash Rako Vachana Mana Mora Vibhavari Shesha Loka Provesha Nidrachari Uta Jeeva Bolo Hari Hari Mukunda Morari Rama Krishna Haya Kriva Nittai Gaur Hari Bo Hari Bo Hari Bo Nittai Gaur Hari Bo Jai Hari Nam Sankirtan Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya
So today is the auspicious day of the appearance of Sita Thakurani, who is the wife of Advaita Acharya. So when we sing uh, the song to uh, glorify the lotus feet of Lord Garanga, when we sing Sri, Chish Krish Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Daya Karamori, so in that song, it's written, Daya Koro Sita Pati Advaita Gosai, Tava Kripa Bole Pai Chaitanya Nitai. So Advaita Acharya is described in that way, Sita Pati, the husband of Sita, because his wife is very chaste, she is very saintly lady, very wonderful qualities, so the husband is known by the name of his wife, Sita Pati. In this way, Advaita Acharya is glorified in the words of the song by Naratam Das Thakur. So Advaita Acharya and his good wife Sita, they had six sons. It's described that they had six sons, but only three of them remained devotees. Other three became asara. In other words, they became useless because they were influenced by the Mayavadi philosophy. So that was regretted, that the followers among the family of Advaita Acharya they had six sons, only three stayed devotees, and three were not devotees. Three were Mayavadis. We often go to Shantipur, which is the home of Advaita Acharya, where he lived with his good wife, Sita Thakurani, and it was there in Shantipur where Lord Chaitanya would come with Lord Nityananda, and Chaitanya Charitamrita describes how they took prasad there at the home of Advaita Acharya. Particularly when Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu took sannyas, after taking sannyas, then he, Lord Chaitanya wanted to go to Vrindavan, and he was in the mood of going to Vrindavan. So Lord Nityananda did a little bit trickery and misled him into thinking he was going to Vrindavan, but actually they came towards Shantipur. And Lord Chaitanya met Ad Advaita Acharya, and he was surprised. And he said to Advaita Acharya, what are you doing here in Vrindavan? And Advaita Acharya replied, My dear Lord, wherever you are, that is Vrindavan. So uh, Advaita Acharya then brought Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as a sannyasi. He brought him to Shantipur and then they sent for a, uh, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mother Sachi Mata to come from Mayapur and she came from Mayapur and she along with Sita Thath Thakarani along with Advaita Acharya's wife together they cooked and there was many devotees came because the devotees all came from Mayapur they'd heard how Lord Chaitanya had taken sannyas and they wanted to greet him and offer their respects to him so for several days they had kirtan there in Shantipur and they had the association of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So during that time, Sachimata along with Sita Thakarani would cook and they would cook very wonderfully. Uh, particularly, uh, there was a, another occasion before Chaitanya Mahaprabhu took sannyas. When he came there, he came to Shantipur with Lord Nityananda, and Advaita Acharya had prepared nice prasadam for everyone. When you go to Shantipur, you can see there's the actual place where they took prasadam. It's a, it's a sacred spot. They have a shrine there where Chaitanya, Nityananda, and Advaita Acharya sat in honored prasadam. So Shantipur, Prabhupada liked to go to Shantipur 
and before he went to America, he would go to Shantipur and he would go and pray to be empowered to preach in America. And at one point, Srila Prabhupada was even thinking to make Shantipur the world headquarters for, Maya, for the ISKCON movement. He was thinking it might be better to have our world headquarters there. But anyway, they got land in Mayapur, so he just settled for Mayapur. But Prabhupada certainly had a deep love for Shantipur, and he went, he prayed a lot there, he chanted a lot of rounds there before he went to America, even before he, before he was a sannyasi, he used to go there to Shantipur. And so Sita Thakurani, she was living there with her husband, Advaita Acharya. And so she was very important, very saintly lady. Among the sons of Advaita Acharya, Achutananda was very prominent. Achutananda was one of the very wonderful sons of Advaita Acharya, and he was a very great devotee of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And when Lord Chaitanya took sannyasa, Chutananda also went there to Jagannath Puri and spent a lot of time there. And, and you can read his, Achutananda's name is mentioned dancing in the kirtan when they would have the sankirtan parties. When they would go to Jagannath Puri, each of the villages would have their own kirtan groups. So there would be the kirtan party from Shantipur, which was Advaita Acharya Prabhu, and then also Achutananda would be in that party also. And each of the villages had their own kirtan, and in each kirtan party, different people would be assigned to chant, and different people would be assigned to dance. And, and in this way, they had the kirtan party very well organized. So Sita Thakurani is the, this is today's her auspicious appearance day, so we're offering our respects to her in honor of her wonderful service as the chaste wife of Advaita Acharya and the mother of wonderful devotees like Achutananda. Another one of the sons of Advaita Acharya, Gopal, he was ordered by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu when they were cleaning the Gundicha temple. They were cleaning the Gundicha temple and Lord Chaitanya told him, Gopal, dance, dance. So Gopal began dancing. He began dancing in ecstasy and at one point he just collapsed and he just fell unconscious and fell to the floor. So Advaita Acharya, being the father, he was actually very concerned and he came to hold the son and they thought the son was leaving the body because he was not breathing even. And they all chanted Nishringa Mantra for the, the boy. But then Lord Chaitanya came and Lord Chaitanya put his hand on the chest and said, Gopal, get up and dance. <laughs> and Gopal came back to life, and he got up and began to dance. And so that pastime is mentioned there in the cleansing of how the son of Advaita Acharya got the mercy of Lord Chaitanya. So wonderful devotees from wonderful parents. All right, so now we're going on to read Srimad Bhagavatam. We're reading uh, Canto 1, Chapter 8, text number 16, first of all. Text number 16. Namamsta hetad ascharyam. Sarvascharya mayechutai 
Anybody else want to chant? Marriages. Ma, do not, Mamsta, think. He, he certainly, certainly. etat all these ascharyam wonderful sarva all ascharyamaye in the all mysterious achute the infallible ya one who idam this creation Mayaya, Maya, by, his energy, by his energy, Devya, Devya transcendental, transcendental Srijati, create, create avati, avati, maintain, maintain hanti, hanti, annihilate, annihilate Aja, Aja, unborn. unborn. Translation, O Brahmanas, do not think this to be especially wonderful in the activities of the mysterious and infallible personality of Godhead. By his own transcendental energy, he maintains and annihilates all material things, although he himself is unborn. You can repeat, O Brahmanas, do not think this to be especially wonderful in the activities 
of the mysterious and infallible personality of Godhead. By his own transcendental energy, he maintains and annihilates all material things, although he himself is unborn. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. The activities of the Lord are always inconceivable to the tiny brain of the living entities. Nothing is impossible for the Supreme Lord, but all his actions are wonderful for us. And thus, he is always beyond the range of our conceivable limits. The Lord is the all-powerful, all-perfect personality of Godhead. The Lord is cent percent perfect, whereas others, namely Narayan, Brahma, Shiva, the demigods, and all other living beings possess only different percentages of such perfection. No one is equal to or greater than him. He is unrivaled. Om Ajnana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakturun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobhistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Bandeham Shri Gara Shri Yatapada Kamalam Shri Karan Vaishnavamstya Shri Rupam Sakrajatam Sahagana Raganathan Vitam Tam Sajevam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakhanitam Scha He Krishna Karana Sindhu Tina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gorange Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patita Nam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Nama Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare so Sutta Goswami is addressing the sages in Naimisharanya. He's saying, O Brahmanas, do not think. Oh, that sounds good, eh? Do not think. And they think, oh, <laughs> let just let the mind go blank. No, of course, we do have to think. But do not think that the, the Lord's activities are in any way limited. Sutta Goswami had been describing about Ashwatthama releasing the Brahmastra weapon and how the Brahmastra weapon is uncounterable. Nothing can overcome it. But Lord Vishnu's own potency could counteract it. So Prabhupada takes up the point that for the Supreme Lord, there is nothing impossible. There is no question of impossible when we talk about 
the activities of the Lord. Prabhupada himself of, used to say, impossible is a word in the fool's dictionary. As far as the devotees are concerned, there is nothing impossible. What is Im seems impossible becomes possible by the arrangement of Lord Krishna. There is no question, oh, impossible, cannot do it. So, so many times people would tell Srila Prabhupada, oh, going to America to spread Krishna consciousness, impossible. Oh, to do so many things, to translate so many books, they would say, impossible. Oh, to make all the malachas and yavanas into devotees, impossible. But Prabhupada showed everyone it was possible by the arrangement of Krishna, by the empowerment of Lord Krishna. So we have to understand the inconceivable potency of Lord Krishna, that the Lord does possess inconceivable potencies. This is very important because without understanding that the Lord has inconceivable potencies, we will never be able to enter into an understanding of the pastimes of Lord Krishna. Just like when we explain about creation, when we explain how universes are coming out of the body of Mahavishnu, then people, ordinary people think, oh, this is impossible, how could it be? But they have not understood that the person behind the creation has inconceivable potencies. And we see examples of inconceivable potencies every day. Right now, in front of us, there, are, there is inconceivable potency. The energy coming from the sun, the heat and light, which is coming from the sun planet every day. Even one moment of time, the energy and light which is coming from the sun is inconceivable. This is an example of the inconceivable potency. Within the universe, there are inconceivable potencies. Why would we think that the person who is responsible for the origin of the universe would not have inconceivable potencies? Prabhupada used to give the example about the frog in the well. The frog in the well only knows about its own well. So one time, another creature had come from the ocean. A turtle had come from the ocean, and the turtle was telling the frog, oh, the ocean is so big. And the frog said, oh, is it twice as big as my well? Turtle said, no, no, much bigger than that. Said, is it three times as big as my well? No, no, bigger than that. And then the frog is perfing his, he said, is it four times as big as my well? And the frog blew up. He, he was expanding himself, and he expanded himself so much that he burst apart. And all of the organs of the frog scattered. So in this way, materialistic people, they try to understand the inconceivable potencies of the Supreme Lord with their imperfect senses and with their own limited mind. So the, their limited mind and senses can never understand the unlimited, that the Lord does possess potencies and energies which are beyond our own comprehension, which are beyond our ability to understand. 
the Lord has so much inconceivable powers. That is crucial to understanding the pastimes of Lord Krishna. Before you can go into the tenth canto, before you can enter into understanding tenth canto and the different pastimes of Lord Krishna there, first of all, we have to hear about the Lord's Shristi Tattva, the Lord's power of creation, how he creates this material world. Once we have understood the inconceivable potencies of the Lord and how he can manifest the creation, then we can, can go on to understand more of the Lord. We have to hear about the Lord's pastimes, just as he comes as a boar, and as Lord Varaha, he can pick up the earth from the bottom of the universe. And we have to understand there are no limitations on the Lord. If he wants, he can appear half lion and half man. We have no conceptions of these things. It's beyond our power to imagine that anyone could have a body, half animal, half man. But Lord Krishna can do these things. He can appear in any different form he likes. He is not subject to the laws of the material nature. So we have to understand the inconceivable potencies of the Supreme Lord. Then we can go on to understand more about the Lord's pastimes and his dealing with devotees. So Srila Prabhupada points out how conditioned souls, living entities like us, that we do not possess all of the qualities which the Supreme Lord has. Rupa Goswami has analyzed the, the Lord and the different qualities which the Lord exhibits, and he has listed a, num a total of 64 different qualities of Lord Krishna. So from these 64 qualities which Lord Krishna possesses, a, a conditioned soul or living entities in the material world can possess only 50 of these qualities. That includes even Lord Brahma. Lord Brahma is also a jiva. And Lord Brahma, in his perfect condition, can produce 50 out of the 64 qualities. Lord Shiva is above the position of Lord Brahma. Lord Shiva, he can display 55 out of the 64 qualities, which Lord Krishna can show. And Lord Vishnu, he can display 60 out of the 64 qualities. But Lord Krishna is unique, that he has all 64 qualities in the most complete extent. So there are four qualities which are not found even in Lord Vishnu, and they are, first of all, Venu Madhurya, that he's very expert in playing on the flute. And his flute playing is so madhurya that it attracts the living entities all over the creation. And then madhurya rupa, that the, the form of the Lord is so attractive that even the Lord himself becomes bewildered when he sees his own reflection. It is described that on one occasion, Lord Krishna was in Dwarka, and he happened to see the reflection of his own body on the marble floor. 
and he was wondering, who is this wonderful personality? So even Lord Krishna becomes bewildered when he sees his own reflection. Then Madhurya Lila, Lord Krishna performs the most amazing pastimes. Along with his devotees, Lord Krishna performs wonderful pastimes like Rasa Lila, where he can expand himself and he can appear with each and every gopi. So this is the wonder of Lord Krishna's pastimes. And one more quality, uh, Madhurya Prema, Prema Madhurya, that he's always with his loving devotees. Krishna never comes alone. He always comes with all of his different associates. Just like when Mother Earth came and appealed to Lord Brahma that my planet is overburdened by so many demoniac kings. At that time, Lord Brahma went with all the demigods and they went to the shore of the ocean of milk and they meditated on Lord Vishnu. And Lord Vishnu, who resides in Sweta Dweep, in the middle of the milk ocean, he, he gave a message to Brahma that you should all take birth in the Yadu dynasty, and I'm also going to come there. So in this way, Lord Krishna was describing that I'm going to come, you should also come, I want you all to be there and take part in the pastimes. So in this way, Lord Krishna is never alone. This is the wonder of Krishna's pastimes, that he enjoys the company of all of his devotees. We see Lord Vishnu. Lord Vishnu is usually alone. But Lord Krishna, Prabhupada said, anybody has pictures of Krishna on his own, that is Mayavadi influence. We don't just worship Krishna, we worship Radha Krishna, or Yashoda Krishna, or Krishna Balaram, but not just Krishna. So it was Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who revealed to everyone the importance of Lord Krishna being with his devotees. And that's why after Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, there were many temples which just had only Krishna deities. So it was Janava Mata, Lord Chaitanya's consort, she would add the deity of Radharani beside Lord Krishna. Instead of just having only Krishna in the temple, she would add the deity of Radharani beside Lord Krishna. And in this way, then the worship can be properly performed. We have to understand the Lord's pastimes, and we have to understand them by service, through the medium of service. We say, Atashri Krishna Nabadi Nabhavid Gryamindriyani Sevan Mukhehe Jivado Swayameva Spurati Yada. The topics of Lord Krishna cannot be understood by our material senses, but he reveals himself when he is pleased by our service. So we use our tongue to serve, to chant the holy name of Krishna, and to also honor the footsteps offered to Krishna. By doing that kind of service, we become qualified to understand Krishna and Krishna's pastimes. As it's mentioned here, the Lord comes, but he is unborn. So this is bewildering for people. We generally hear Krishna has a mother and father. Vasudeva and Devaki are generally understood to be the parents of Lord Krishna. And we talk about the Janmastan of Krishna, Mathura, 
is the Janma Stan of Lord Krishna. But we say Krishna is unborn. Indeed, Lord Krishna himself tells us that he is unborn. In the fourth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna is describing transcendental knowledge of himself. Ajopisana vyayatma bhutanam ishvaropisam prakritim swamadistaya sambhavami atma mayaya. Although I am unborn and my transcendental body never deteriorates, Lord Krishna says, I still appear in every millennium. So Lord Krishna is unborn, but at the same time he takes birth. This is certainly bewildering for ordinary people. How to understand? We have to understand the inconceivable nature of Lord Krishna's pastimes. Don't try to understand with our limited mind and senses. Someone asked me the other day, how can I understand that Krishna is unborn? I said, well, you have to hear. You have to hear from Krishna. Lord Krishna himself is saying that he is unborn. Why should you doubt? We have to simply hear the message of Lord Krishna and then repeat. It's not that we can understand these things because we are conditioned. We, are, we have imperfect senses. We're subject to illusion. We make mistakes. How can we ever understand that the Lord is unborn? We can understand these things when he reveals them to us. When he reveals to, and why will he reveal them to us? When he is pleased by our service. When he sees that we have genuinely desired to serve him. Then at that time he can reveal himself to us. It is not that we, we ourselves can understand by our own mind and sense. We have to be blessed by the grace of Lord Krishna. Then he can reveal himself to us. If he wants, he can reveal. And if he doesn't want, he can simply cover himself. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Naham prakasha sarvadma yoga maya samavrita. Mudo yam napijanati lokamama jamavyayam. I am never manifest to the foolish and the unintelligent. For them I am covered by my eternal creative potency. So Krishna doesn't show himself to the foolish, but he does reveal himself to his devotees when he is pleased by service. We are depending on the mercy of Krishna. How to get the mercy of Krishna? Simply by service. We do service for Krishna. This is our position. He is the master, we are the servants. So, when Ashwatthama fired the Brahmastra weapon, certainly they thought, that's it, but the child is going to be killed. Nothing can counteract it. But Lord Krishna was there to counteract. Lord Krishna heard the calling of Uttara. Uttara came running to Krishna that I'm not, she said, I'm not worried about myself. Let me be killed, but don't let the child in my womb be killed. 
So Lord Krishna was pleased with the, the calling of Uttara. And Lord Krishna expanded himself in the womb of Uttara and protected the child from the heat of the Brahmastra weapon. So we don't believe that such anything is impossible. No, everything is possible by the grace of the Lord. We are depending simply on that grace. We'll just go on to text number 17. Thus saved, thus saved from the radiation of the Brahmana, of the Brahmastra, Kunti, the chaste devotee of the Lord, and her sons, and Draupadi, addressed Lord Krishna as he started for home. Purport. Kunti is described here as sati, or chaste, due to her unalloyed devotion to Lord Sri Krishna. Her mind will now be expressed in the following prayers for Lord Krishna. A chaste devotee of the Lord does not look to others namely any other living entity or demigod, even for deliverance for, from danger. That was all along the characteristic of the whole family of the Pandavas. They knew nothing except Krishna, and therefore the Lord was always ready to help them in all respects and in all circumstances. That is the transcendental nature of the Lord. He reciprocates the dependence of the devotee. One should not therefore look for help from imperfect living beings or demigods, but one should look for all help from Lord Krishna, who is competent to save his devotees. Such a chaste devotee also never asks the Lord for help, but the Lord, out of his own accord, is always anxious to render it. So this is very relevant. Today, of course, just now, everybody's doing Ganesh Puja. They're all worshiping Lord Ganesh to get rid of the obstacles. But chaste devotees, they will simply worship Lord Krishna. So we don't actually worship the different demigods. We simply worship Lord Krishna. And by worship of Lord Krishna, all of our desires, all of our problems, everything of is overcome. A devotee simply depends on Krishna. And Prabhupada describes here how the Pandavas and their mother, Queen Kunti, and their wife, Draupadi, that was their nature. That even though they faced so many difficulties, they had so many problems, so many troubles, one after another, but they never gave up the shelter of Lord Krishna. No matter what happened to them, they never lost their faith in Krishna. So that is chaste. That is the meaning of being chaste devotee. That we don't look to anyone else for help. We simply look to Krishna. And Prabhupada said, actually, the devotee won't even ask Krishna for help. A devotee just simply surrenders that whatever's happening, a devotee will understand this is Krishna, that Krishna's there, that if Krishna wants me to suffer, I will suffer. And if Krishna wants me to be delivered from the problem, Krishna will arrange it. 
We don't have to bother about any, we don't have to go looking for some arrangement, you know, go worship this demigod. Oh, I have a health problem. We will worship the sun god. Oh, I need money. I will worship Lakshmi. Oh, I have this problem. I will worship Ganipati. Different demigods for all the different problems of the world. That is not the mood of the devotee. One who is surrendered to Krishna, he knows that only Krishna can give protection. No one else can protect us. If Krishna wants us to live, nobody can kill us. And if Krishna wants us to die, nobody can save us. So the devotee always just simply depends on Krishna. Whatever you want, Krishna, I am yours. This is the chaste devotee. And this was the mood of the Pandavas. They had so many troubles. Even they, we saw what happened to Draupadi. She had problems. She had Durvasa coming with all of his disciples. And they wanted food. They said, we're just going to take our bath. We'll come back. We'll get the meal ready. And what does Draupadi do? Well, she, she just has some tamarind leaf. Some, there was just some remnants in her Drupadi's pot and she offered it to Krishna and because Krishna accepted that tamarind leaf, whatever remnants were there in the pot, Krishna accepted and everyone became satisfied. So Drupadi took shelter of Krishna. She overcame her problem. And when Drupadi was lost in the gambling match and they were trying to rip off her sari. They wanted to see her naked. They thought we will, we will disgrace her and that her husbands could do nothing to save her. But Draupadi took shelter of Krishna. She called out to Krishna and Krishna came in the form of the unlimited sari to protect her. We saw Arjuna, Arjuna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra had problems. He had vowed that he was going to kill Jayadrat and the day was almost over. But Krishna had to make some trickery so that Arjuna could still kill Jayadrat and keep his life. Whenever Arjuna was in trouble, Krishna would come and help him. Just like when Arjuna went to Dwarka and the Brahmana was complaining that my wife, she, she had a miscarriage at birth. The child was a miscarriage at birth. And he, the, the Brahmana came complaining, you're the ruler of Dwarka, you're supposed to protect you're supposed to protect my child. So Arjuna was there and Arjuna vowed, the next time your child, your, next time your wife delivers a child, I will protect your child. And if I cannot protect, I will give up my own life. And then it happened, the Brahmana's wife again delivered a child and again was a miscarriage. And so Arjuna was in a problem because he had vowed he would give up his own life. So what to do? Krishna was there and Krishna took Arjuna with him and they went to see Mahavishnu in the Kajyo Ocean and there they found all the sons of the Brahmana and they brought all the children back to life and gave them to the Brahmana. So Krishna protected Arjuna he protected him in the battle of Kurukshetra. He protected them all the time. And we see also Bhima, how, how Lord Krishna arranged for the glorification of Bhima. He arranged that Bhima would kill Jarasandha. Jarasandha had the strength of 10,000 elephants. 
He was a very powerful personality. He had arrested 20,000 kings, and he was keeping them all in his prison. None of these kings would pay the taxes to Jarasandha, so he had arrested all of them. And he was so powerful, 20,000 kings could not overcome Jarasandha. Actually, Jarasandha, he was, a, he was a devotee of the demigods. He was going to worship uh, Vai, the, uh, Kali Vairaga, and he was going to offer, he, he wanted to offer 100,000 kings as sacrifice to Kali Bhairava, to human sacrifice. He was such a demon. And so, Maharaj Yudhisthira wanted to perform the Rajasuya sacrifice, but he needs to get subjugation. All the other kings have to ad admit subordination to Maharaj Yudhisthira. So Jarasandha will never accept. So they have to fight Jarasandha. So it was arranged that Bhima would fight Jarasandha. And with the help of Lord Krishna, Bhima defeated Jarasandha and killed him. So this was Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna, of course, he could have killed Jarasandha himself. He defeated him already 17 times in the battle. But he wanted Bhima to get the credit. And he arranged that Bhima could kill Jarasandha. And he arranged Maharaj Yudhisthira could perform this Rajasuya Yagna. Maharaj Yudhisthira is the ruler. He had so much opulence, greater even than Brahma. Even Brahma Loka, the opulence, could not equal the opulence of Maharaj Yudhisthira. So Maharaj Yudhisthira was so famous. His, his fame was there because of his devotion to Krishna. And Nakula and Sahadev, they also showed their glory. At the time of the Rajasuya Yagna, they have to do the Agra Puja. They have to select the most worshipable personality. At that time, Nakula and Sahadev stood up and they spoke the glories of Lord Krishna, that Lord Krishna is the most worshipable person. Everyone should worship him. And in this way, the Nakula and Sahadev agitated the mind of Sishupal. Sishupal became very disturbed when he heard them praise Lord Krishna. And Sishupal got up and he began to blaspheme Krishna. And so at that time, Lord Krishna killed Sishupal. But we can understand the glory of Draupadi and Queen Kunti and the five Pandavas, how they were completely surrendered, completely devoted to Lord Krishna. Even though they all had to go in exile, they had to go into the forest and they had to live there for years, they had to do one year in, in incognito, so many difficulties, they accepted. And they never lost faith in Krishna, even though they had so many, it seems like problems or difficult, but they never ever doubted Lord Krishna, that Lord Krishna is there, he's their shelter, and he's their refuge. So that is the nature of a chaste devotee. All right, any questions? Yes, Prabhu.
why the three sons of Advaita Acharya fell, how they became imperial. Well, one possible explanation for the deviation of three of the sons of Advaita Acharya could be given to the fact that Advaita Acharya, at one point, he'd been teaching the Yoga Vashista, right? Because Lord Chaitanya was always honoring Advaita Acharya as, you know, senior. Advaita Acharya was much, much elder in age than Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So Lord Chaitanya would always come and honor him. Advaita Acharya was also a disciple of Madhavendra Puri. And Madhavendra Puri was a guru of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's guru. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's guru was Ishwara Puri. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would respect Advaita Acharya because he's the god brother of his guru. And because of his elderly age, different, many reasons he was respecting Advaita Acharya. So Advaita Acharya did not like that. He wanted to respect Chaitanya Mahaprabhu because Advaita understood that, Ch that Ch Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was actually the Lord himself. He saw him as the Supreme Lord and he was worshipping him and honoring him. And Lord Chaitanya wouldn't let Advaita Acharya do that. So then Advaita Acharya, he made the plan that he will preach the Yoga Vashishta. Now the Yoga Vashishta is a book full of impersonal philosophy. And it preaches about the goal of life being to merge into the Brahman. It's a Yujya Mukti, impersonalism. So Advaita Acharya was preaching like that and he was calling people, come, come to my home, come in here, Yoga Vashishta. And he's preaching, to, the goal of life is to merge, you should become one. The goal of life is to get liberation. We should all want to get, become one with the Supreme. This is the goal of life. So when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu heard, he was angry. And he came all the way over to Shantipur. And he picked up Advaita Acharya and he threw him on the ground and he beat him. And then he said, you rascal, you called me to come here. You were the one, you woke me up. I was sleeping in Vaikuntha and you woke me up to come here. And now you're preaching this Mayavadi nonsense. And he was beating him. And Advaita Achari was in ecstasy. And Mother Sita was pleading, oh no, please don't kill my husband. Oh, please don't kill my husband. A lot of women would be happy. Kill him, kill him. <laughs> Get rid of my husband. But Mother Sita, she liked her husband. She wanted to keep him. So this was one reason that Advaita Acharya had preached this impersonal Yoga Vashista and it had influenced three of his sons. So they had taken the path of impersonalism. And because they were smartas, smarter. So they wanted, they liked that. They wanted to be smart. They didn't like the Vaishnava philosophy. They, they were more attracted to the smarter philosophy that we're the brahmanas, we're the head of the society. You should honor us, you should respect us. So they took, they, they because Advaita was the head of all the brahmana community there at Shantipur. So they had position, respectability. So they, they wanted to keep that, they didn't like Vaishnav philosophy, that everybody can become devotee, 
Anybody can become devotee. Anyone can become devotee of the Lord. Anyone can become pure devotee. They like more smarter philosophy. The, I'm, I'm not able to understand fully what he's saying. Huh? Earlier, Advaita Acharya has a mood that he was inviting the Lord, the entire Kali Yuga is there, everybody is fallen, nobody is practicing devotion. Ah. He was in that mood. He was, at one point in time, he was so angry that if he doesn't appear, I will destroy the entire world. He was in that mood. Ah. But right now, he is preaching impersonal philosophy and what teachings he wants to give from within his family, with his family. What teaching he wants to give and by preach? By, us, by using his sons, what teachings he wants to give us? Is, is he not capable of delivering his own sons? Or how, is how he not understand? capable of delivering his own how sons? How can you understand uh, these two kinds of consciousness of Advaita Acharya? Well, the you have to understand, you know, father, can, how much they can control the son, you know. Up to the age of 15, you can control. But after the child becomes like 15 or old, older, then it's a man. You've got to give them independence. You can't force your children. You know, you're a brahmachari, you don't have children. You don't know the difficulty in bringing up children. You have children, to make them devotees, it's a very difficult thing. Even you may be devote, you may be very good devotee yourself, doesn't mean the children will follow. Even your Advaita Acharya, it doesn't mean, although he's an incarnation, he's Mahavishnu, or he's Sadashiva, why he can influence his own children to be devotees. Well, three of them were good devotees. And the other three, they were just impersonalists. They were smarter. That was all. They didn't take, they didn't accept uh, the Vaishnava philosophy. But they were cultured Brahmanas. So how much you can deliver your own children it's a very, very difficult thing to bring children up to be devoted. Just like Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada also had three sons. You know, they're, you know, the youngest one is favorable. But even Prabhupada was taking them to the temple when they were children. He would bring them to the temple. He brought them up to be devotees. But, you know, they grow up, they get married, they, you know, they, they just, they, there's so many things to occupy the mind. Not everybody is so willing to take up Krishna consciousness and to be devotee. And so you cannot force people. Everybody has free will. Even if you're the incarnation of God and you have children. You, we see, look at uh, Bomasura. Bomasura is another example. You know, he's a child from Bhumi and Lord Varaha. And he was a demon. And Lord Krishna had to come and kill him. 
Is that what to speak of Advaita Acharya's children? <laughs> to make them devotees. Not, not very easy. Yes, okay. Like you mentioned about uh, uh, Jarasandh, he had 10,000 elephants power and also... He had what? 10,000 elephants power, strength. Uh -huh. So also the Bhima has an equivalent power. So why the Bhima is not able to defeat himself and why he is like, you know, uh, taking uh, help of Krishna in that way? So this is the question. Yeah. Well, they were equally matched. Bhima and Jarasandha, they both had the strength of 10,000 elephants. And so it's that it's sometimes it's like that. When you get wrestlers, which are, who are equal, you get a draw. So Bhima and Jarasandha, they were fighting for days and days, and it was a draw. It said when Bhima also fought Duryodhan, that time also, it was a draw pretty much. Bhima was stronger, but Duryodhana was more skillful. So, they fought each other with clubs. It was a draw. And then Krishna gave the clue that you hit him below the belt. So similarly, Krishna gave the clue to Bhima how to kill Jarasandha. Because Jarasandha was joined by the witch. Jarasandha was actually born in two halves. And when the child was born, he was in two halves, so the parents threw him away. They didn't want him, because they thought two halves, what's the good of it, you know? But then the two halves were found by a witch. There was a witch called Jara, and Jara joined the two halves together. So he got the name Jara Sanda, one who is joined by the witch Jara. So Lord Krishna took a twig, and he split it down the middle. And in this way he told Bhima, you can kill Jarasandha in that way. So Bhima understood. And he came forward and he took one leg and with the other leg he kept his foot on the ground. And he ripped him right down the middle. Right. Right down the middle. His whole body ripped into half. And he threw the two halves away. And in this way, Bhima defeated Jarasandha. Sometimes Lord Krishna would utilize this thing. You could say, oh, it was a trick. No. He was a demon. Jarasandha was a big demon. He was keeping, I said, 20,000 kings were in prison. And he was planning to do human sacrifice. He wanted to sacrifice all these kings. He was such a demon. So Lord Krishna arranged for Bhima to be glorified. At the same time, Jarasandha also got glorified. Krishna is very fair. He, ar he arranged also for the glorification of Jarasandha. Because Jarasandha, he, he was fond of giving charity. He liked to give charity to the brahmanas. And that's how they arranged the fight. That Bhima and Krishna and Arjuna went to Jarasandha dressed like brahmanas. And they said, Tora Dan DGA. Right? Give me some charity. And what do you want? What charity you want? What Dan you want? We want a fight. But then he thinks, Jarasandha, I'm not going to fight Krishna. He ran away. I was fighting him and he ran away from me. I'm not going to fight him now. And he said, Arjuna, he's not a good match for me. He's not strong enough. I can easily defeat him. He said, Bhima, I'll fight him. He'll give me a good He wants a good fight. Jarasandha showed his charitable nature. 
he granted a fight to them. He, Jarasandha liked to follow the Vedic culture. He liked to give charity to Brahmanas. But he was a demon. So just because somebody gives charity to Brahmins doesn't mean he's a great devotee. What was his motive? So Krishna glorified Jarasandha. Yes? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, you said uh, Lord Sri Krishna possesses 64 qualities and Jivatma can have 50. But we learned somewhere uh, uh, in Bhagavad Gita that uh, the living being also you know, uh, have the same quality, although in the quantity we are different, but quality-wise we are the same. The living beings have the same qualities? Yes. Well, <laughs> not 100% not the same. We have only 78%. It means 50 out of 64 in our most perfect condition. We don't have all of Krishna's qualities. Krishna, we were explaining that there are certain qualities which are only in Krishna. Even Vishnu doesn't have them. And there's more qualities which Shiva doesn't have them. And, and when we talk about living entities like Brahma <coughs> in the most perfect condition, then only 78% means 50 out of 64. So yes, one in quality, but actually not, not fully, not 100% in quality. Yes? Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared uh, to deliver people through the holy name and he never used any violence against anyone but in the case of Advaita Acharya he started beating him <laughs> any uh, like how can we understand this Advaita Acharya beat him, I beat him because he was so angry Mahaprabhu has come to deliver the the Krishna conscious teaching, the philosophy of devotion, and Advaita Acharya had brought him here and called him here, but he was preaching impersonalism. He's talking about merging and becoming one. So Mahaprabhu got angry. Krishna has feelings, and Mahaprabhu also has feelings. Certain things, you know, people, sometimes people, that if they do something, then he would get angry, just like Chankazi. When Chankazi stopped the Sankirtan, then Lord Chaitanya took action. He called everybody civil disobedience. And they all came out in big procession. And they had torches. And they were shouting, kill the Kazi, kill the Kazi. And so Mahaprabhu had organized this big civil disobedience protest. Of course, they didn't kill the Kasi, but they let him know that if you stop the Sankirtan movement, then we will take action. So certain times, Lord Chaitanya would show his displeasure. And certainly he, 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 he wanted that Advaita Acharya should not be preaching impersonalism. So yeah, Lord Chaitanya shows that he has he, he does have feelings. He's a person. The Lord is a person. He didn't kill him, but he beat him. That, that was also fulfilling the desire of Advaita Acharya. Advaita Acharya was happy because he wanted that Lord Chaitanya would not respect him. 
So Lord Chaitanya was reciprocating the desire of Advaita Acharya by beating him. Advaita desired that. So for the pleasure of his devotee, Lord Chaitanya did this. Okay. Any other question? Okay. Stop here. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada. Ki. Srimad Bhagavatam. Ki. Gopra